I'm a brother, uh, Dr. Yanis Kutimili, PhD of the Fresno chapter. And the topic of our presentation today is the Greeks of Italy, which is presented by Dr. Schulman. Uh, Dr. Edward Schulman received his PhD from UCLA and has been teaching at the University of Nevada, Reno, since 2010, where he focuses on late antique and early medieval Mediterranean. He published a book on rediscovering statehood in Italy, had geography and the late antique past in medieval Ravenna in 2016, and is working on a new book project on Greek identity and language in medieval Italy as part of an interdisciplinary team. His research extends into the interconnections between history and the environment of the Middle Ages. Um, this is a district, this is a lecture of the District 21. A virtual lecture series organized by Acheba Golden Gate District 21. Acheba was founded almost a century ago by a series, by a group of uh, Greek restaurateurs in Atlanta who were getting tired of their restaurants being owned by the Ku Klux Klan. At this moment, at this moment, we will mute uh, all participants except uh, the presenter, and I will hand it off to the presenter, Dr. Schulman. Yannis, thank you so much. Uh, and I want to thank uh, all the participants today for uh, participants for, for the, the audience for uh, giving up your uh, Saturday afternoon. Um, what I'd like to present today, and hopefully I'll try to make this as exciting as possible. <laughs> um, is uh, basically the the core of this new book project I have. Um, which explores the history of Greeks in medieval Italy from around the year 500 AD to 1100 AD. What I've in uncovered in my research is that it's not just one wave of migration, but there's an extended period of Greeks or Greek-speaking people, we'll call them Greeks, um, very broadly defined from all over the Eastern Mediterranean, moving to the Italian peninsula. Um, and for, for lots of different reasons, and we'll address some of those, uh, give you some very interesting um, individuals. Um, but much like contemporary Greek diasporas, these medieval migrants um, acculturated, um, but more so than any other group I've found, they maintained um, language and religious traditions. So they, they became Italians in many respects, but yet kept Greek, brought in saints that were not very well known in the East, um, and, and really kind of fused into um, Italian culture. And actually the point I'll probably end with today is that um, the roots of this um, form this tree known as the Italian Renaissance. The Italian Renaissance could not exist really without the long history of Greeks living in the Italian uh, peninsula. And maybe we should not even call it the Italian peninsula, maybe we call it the greater Greek, greater Greek Western peninsula. Um, so basically, my, my, what I'll cover here is from Byzantine soldiers in the 6th century to monks in the 9th century, bishops and dukes, each successive wave of Greek immigrants introduced and then reintroduced into Italy and Western Europe important uh, classical traditions as well as uh, Christian religious traditions that would become central to the medieval West moving forward. Um, but uh, you might think, though, perhaps, and, and quite correctly, um, that if we wanted to actually talk about Greeks in medieval Italy, we should go back a lot further. Um, and we're really, we're, where we should really begin is with uh, Magna Graecia. Now Magna Graecia is the colonized territories of southern Italy. Um, so all of the major cities in sort of the Hellenic homelands in the 8th century BC sent out colonists um, across the Mediterranean into the Black Sea. Um, but really the, the strength of the colonies was in southern Italy and Sicily. Uh, and so this map that I'm showing you um, just demonstrates the, the density of Greek settlements uh, 2,700 years ago. So, so Sicily, Calabria, um, Salento. And, and this is an important part of sort of the, of the development of, sort of Greeks in the Mediterranean to such an extent that if you were to ask me, and maybe I'm quite biased but given what I, I research, uh, if you wanted to see the best Greek temples, well, I, w I might send you uh, to Paestum, um, um, which is a city named after uh, Poseidon, but that's beside the point, uh, which has these amazing Doric 
uh, 7th century BC, 6th century BC, uh, temples to Hera. There are two of them. Um, I could also send you to uh, Agrigento, um, which is a city in Sicily that also has these beautiful Doric temples uh, that date back to the classical period. Um, and so what this means is that if I'm talking about medieval Greeks, who are in Italy, they are not newcomers. I mean, some of them are newcomers, but they're coming to a place where there has long been a tradition of Greeks. Um, and I didn't in include a slide for this, um, but there are all these sorts of kind of Romans would make jokes if, when, when the Roman Empire arose that, ah, well, Rome is really great except for all these Greek people who are speaking Greek in the streets and bringing their Eastern goods. And even before that, the Etruscans would trade with uh, mainland Greek uh, metropolis um, and, and bring goods in. And so it's, not a, it's a world in which Greeks were already so well interwoven um, that it's, it's not, you can't really find a beginning. I, I'm going to give you a beginning um, in the Middle Ages, but we have to keep in mind that this is something that goes almost 3,000 years back. Um, you would also not be mistaken to recognize that it goes all the way into the present. There are lots of Greeks in Italy of various kinds, of various types. And this map looks very, very frightening. <laughs> These are the, 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 the dialects, uh, basically mostly Romance language dialects, so uh, Sicilian and Italian. Um, but if we go to the south and we look again at Calabria and Puglia, what we'll notice are two, so the very, very toe of the boot and the very heel of the boot uh, contain communities that speak Greco. And so they're not speaking, well, they're not speaking, they're, they're speaking Greco, which is the language that, as it is described by the surrounding communities, they don't, they call it Greco, but it's not really that. And this is a, a version of a dialect of Greek that has been spoken in those areas for at least 800 years. Um, and it's just sort of the, all these movements and these migrations have left their mark even permanently. So that if we look at modern Italy today, we will still find uh, native Greek speakers. That isn't, um, we should also keep in mind that, that Italy uh, <laughs> tried to, uh, um, tried to once seize Corfu and uh, had these imperialistic expansions before the second, the second World War for the Dodecanese and Rhodes. But, but beyond that, there, there was this sort of this native population of Greek speakers um, who kept um, also the, the Greek liturgy alive um, in their communities. Um, so, so there's that. The other very interesting thing uh, about modern Italy, and, it, and modern Italians don't, I think, recognize to the extent that, the, that Greek contributes to their heritage, um, is that if you look at last names, and last names are, are useful sometimes, are useful indicators of you know, past professions or where people are from or some other identifier. If you look at the top, uh, top, la top 10 last names, Greco, Greek, is, is number 10, um, with 13,000 families sharing the name Greco. And if you were to plot this on a map, you might think, oh, well, this is just, this is just southern Italy. And it, it's not. This is a map of where we find uh, the surname Greco. And you find it everywhere. Yes, a lot of it is in Calabria, and a lot of it is in Apulia, the bottom of the boot. Um, but there's lots of it in the north. There's lot, it's just basically every province in, in Italy has people who, whose last name is Greco. And I'll, and I'll end with this, I think, because this is something we actually see in the Middle Ages, people identifying themselves with the name Greco because they are Greek or descended from Greeks. So they're very conscious of that. Um, but what I'd like to really do with the rest of this presentation and you'll see there's this wonderful blue bar which will show you where we're going and how much we've got to do is sort of present the history of Greeks and Byzantine and Byzantine Italy um, for the uh, so the, what what happens over time. I then want to talk a little bit about individuals, people who I'm writing about. I have six of them. Um, I have a lot more if we wanted to, if we wanted to if we wanted to stay for another hour. I could certainly. Um, share some more of those people with you. Uh, and they're really interesting case studies because they demonstrate how in the very complex political world of sort of the post-Roman post -Roman Italian peninsula, people who identified as Greek would express that identity. Sometimes it's by calling themselves Greek. Sometimes it's by speaking Greek or using Greek script um, or certain religious practices, uh, venerating certain saints. So all of that, I think, comes into play to sort of forming these medieval identities. I'd like to then focus a little bit about religious culture 
um, only because I think there's a, a large a large section of what we of what is taken for granted um, in terms of religious practices in the medieval West that directly comes from um, the Byzantine and Greek traditions. So, for example, the veneration of the Virgin or Theotokos um, that that it really only comes after it's kind of re it's rediscovered, um, although it had been existing in existence in Greek speaking communities since the third century, um, it's rediscovered in the West in the tenth century. I'll end by talking a little bit about um, the Renaissance and how the Renaissance owes a debt and has sort of its legacy in these Greek communities, um, to some extent continuing migration patterns, and then a few we can sort of tie into some other other research. Um, so I'm thinking about to think about medieval Italy, where and when the the moment that I think is most important as a sort of a starting point. I guess I could go back to the Magna Graecia in the sixth century, seventh century BC. I'm going to start in 536 AD, um, and in this map, what you see is the, the purple represents the Byzantine Empire under the and Justinian had been able to um, reconquer North Africa, which had been controlled by the, the Vandals, which is a Germanic speaking group, part of the Iberian Peninsula, um, and the Italian Peninsula, which had been under control um, of the Ottomans. Um, but following that conquest, you see an enormous influx of new people coming into Italy, people speaking Greek, and I, I'm going to give you some examples of those because they, they, they leave us with uh, kind of amazing mementos. Um, and sort of continue on with the history. So in 536, there's a isn't a 20 year war to conquer the Italian peninsula, but it is. And we find all these soldiers who are coming from the east. Some of them are coming from like Greece proper or Asia Minor or even the Levantine coast. But they are establishing their Greek speakers who are establishing themselves um, in Italy. This goes on. This this doesn't last very long. Uh, and only last, we only have a 30-year period where the entire peninsula is under sort of Byzantine control um, until another barbarian group or Germanic-speaking group of, of Lombards comes in and conquers bits and pieces of the Italian peninsula. And what they leave in their wake are communities of native, we we'll call them native Italian or native Latin speakers, and communities where there were quite a few Greeks. So the city of Ravenna, which had become the capital of Italy, Rome, which had both Greek monks, but also um, the popes in the 6th, 7th, and 8th centuries, um, were or many of them were sort of ethnically Greek or called themselves sort of Syrian, but sort of Greek speakers from, from, the, from the Levant. Um, and then in, in the southern part of, of Italy, they were still controlled directly by Constantinople. So you had this sort of this, this political mashup. And it's also within this moment that you see more soldiers coming to try to shore up Byzantine possessions in Italy. Um, this eventually um, does, is unsuccessful, and by 751, uh, that sort of that wonderful purple area where it says Exarchate collapses um, under, the, under a, a Lombard conquest. Um, but you'll still see there's Naples, there's Rome, there's the Duchy of Calabria. Those are all still Byzantine territories. And so Greeks are still coming and going. Texts. Um, things that are written, um, new traditions are still coming into Italy through those 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 territories that are controlled directly by like Constantinople. Um, by 900, the map looks dramatically different. Um, you still have Byzantine control in parts of the south. Sicily has fallen to um, Muslims from North Africa, from from what's the Emirate of Ifriqiya. They establish a new emirate in um, in Sicily. Um, but what you see again, there's this, a, a purple blob north of the north of Amalfi is Naples or Neapolis, um, or which is has <laughs> a city with a Greek name, um, which by this point is in fact almost independent. Um, and Naples is a really interesting interesting place. It's uh, it's unique, I think, in Italian history, um, but it also is unique in the fact that it was established by Greek speakers, but there was a Greek colony and had a Sometimes my sometimes majority or sometimes very strong minority um, living in the city, building churches where the liturgy was always in Greek, so the liturgy of, of, of Basil the Great, um, monks who would who would you know who wouldn't speak Latin at all, who were just working in Greek, and so there's this very interesting dynamic for 
<laughs> for 1,500 years, that I think takes place in Naples. And I, I'll, I'll give you a few examples of that as well. Um, but by the end of the oh, by the end of the end of the 11th century, we have the the Normans, these sort of these people from northern France coming in, these mercenaries and taking over, kicking out the Byzantines. But what's so fascinating is that although they kick out politically uh, the Byzantine dukes and all sorts of other sort of uh, Byzantine soldiers, Byzantine monks, Byzantine administrators stay on and become part of the the administration of the, the Normans of southern Italy. Uh, and I have, I have one great example of that. So that's the sort of, this is the time the time period I'm going to work in. Um, and these are sort of some of the major events that will, I think, help inform us about the way in which sort of these Greeks coming in and establishing themselves, um, the sort of the context for that. So I can give you my, I've got six examples. I'm, I'm not going to spend a ton of time. <laughs> We're, you're not going to get a, a 10 minutes on each of them. I just sort of want to, this is just a, a, a kind of an amuse-bouche. These are, are six sort of people for whom we know there was an affinity to, to Greek identity, to Greek language, to religious practice in really interesting ways. Um, the first three uh, come from the sort of this period following the conquest of Italy by Justinian and are all sort of related to something like the administration of sort of early Byzantine Italy. The second three case studies are quite varied. Um, they have to deal with translation, with choices about how you demonstrate your affinity to language. In the case of George of Antioch, um, really the way in which Greek traditions um, found their way into sort of these, these new kingdoms in, in Italy. Um, that were sort of rivals to Constantinople, very distant, <laughs> very distant rivals. Um, and so I'll just sort of move on and give you these examples. The, the first is a, is a fascinating, it's a tomb, it's not a tombstone, it's sort of a dedicatory, dedica dedicatory inscription of, this, of the church of Santa Cecilia in Rome. This is not a church that, there are churches that are known to have the Greek communities in this period of the Middle Ages. This is not one of them. Um, and what this person has done is establish their tombstone, and it says Theodorus Grecus Byzantius, uh, Theodorus, a, a Byzantine, a Greek from Byzantium, which is amazing and very, very specific. Uh, and what's so interesting is that even though he is, he's clearly identifying himself as Greek, clearly from Constantinople, or Byzantius, um, his inscription is in Latin. So he's integrated into a local community. Uh, in Rome around the year 600, so six, six, between 600 and 620. Um, and that's sort of one version of, of, of that kind of integration. On the other hand, you have people who, who don't integrate, and this is an amazing document. This is from 600. It's written on papyrus, and it's huge. It's about, I'd say, about four feet long. And it records a donation of a man named Stephanus, who's from Naples. He's not from anywhere else. He's from Naples. Uh, and he was giving, he's donating land to the Church of Ravenna, which was the capital at the time of, this, of the city, but writing in Rome. So all the major cities are involved. And what's very, very fascinating is his inscription. So he signs the document. Yes, this is the donation of the property. I'm very happy to give it. Um, please carry on. Um, and it may be hard to see in, in this particular slide, um, but he's writing in Greek, clear as day. Um, and... He's writing in Greek script, but he's not writing in Greek language. He's writing in local Latin dialect. But why, why should you learn the local, why should you learn to like, write Latin script? You write Greek script just fine. And so we have this wonderful, wonderful document in which he's like, of course I'll sign, but I'm going to sign in, in Greek script. Uh, it says, Philios, or, so, so, sorry, Flavio Stefanos Illustris uh, con manen uh, en... Civitate Neapolitanus Huic Captule Adie Presenti Donationis. So he's he's writing in in sort of this interesting example of using Greek script to write in Latin. And and he's not the only one. In fact, of these documents of this time, so between let's say 550 and 700, um, we have we have about 50 documents, and 10% of them. So, <laughs> right? so it's not a huge number. So five of them have exactly this this instance where people are they're not 
going to describe themselves as Greek but write in Latin, they're going to write in Greek. And what's fascinating is that the people who are also part of that legal process to give this donation are writing in Latin and identify Stephanos as Grecos. So there's clearly, there's something about using Greek script that f for him in 600 re uh, re-emphasizes uh, his identity. Um, that is, and that's one example. The, the other example of this, and we don't know, we don't know anything else about Stephanos. Stephanos is just a guy who happened to have a lot of land and donated it, sort of the, the mysteries of time. We do know a lot about the exarch Isaac. Isaac is a military general who for 20 years rules Italy uh, on behalf of the emperors in Constantinople. Uh, and when he dies, he is buried in this sarcophagus. This may not be the original sarcophagus, but the lid is original. And across the top of the lid uh, is inscribed this beautiful poem. Uh, and the poem is sort of very high style, early Byzantine Greek um, poetry. And, I, it's, and it's amazing. And you can read it either as two columns or you can read it across each line. And for this, for this exarch, who probably thought about what he wanted to represent on his death, it's really clear. He's an Easterner who's working in Italy. He's working for the emperors. Um, he calls himself an Armenian, although at that point, like, probably somewhat a Greek speaker of Armenian descent, uh, so even, even further back. Um, and it's, a, it's such an amazing, such an amazing monument. Um, now, I'll just, I won't read all of it, but it goes, here lies the distinguished commander guarding Rome unharmed in the West. So he's clearly a general who's come to protect Italy from the Lombards. But what's fascinating is that he's, his, his choice, his epigraphic choice, is to write in Greek script and very high-level poetry. Poetry that I found very hard to translate. Um, it probably isn't even worth doing it. But it, it, this is a, a wonderful example, again, of how the, there's this variance of identities, lots of different ways to express them. And it's not just that they're, they're Greeks and they're identifying as Greeks. They're bringing with them an enormous amount of, of culture from the East that then is imbued into the Italian peninsula in all sorts of interesting ways. Uh, and we'll see those, actually, in, in my next sort of three examples. I won't talk specifically about the Dukes and Bishops of Naples, although they are fascinating. If you wanted to ask me more about them, I, I've spent a lot of time thinking and writing about them recently. Um, what's so interesting is that even though Naples, after the third century AD, is predominantly Latin, Latin speaking, um, the Dukes and the Bishops who, from really from 600 on, and definitely by 700, are all using Greek in interesting ways in sort of public, public-facing uh, materials. So I've given you an example of the seal of Duke George, which is in, which has a Greek monograph and the text is in Greek. A foles, so a coin, which is on one side uh, San Gennaro, uh, Saint Januarius, San Gennaro, you know, and the other side it says Neapolis in Greek. Uh, and then Athanasius II, who was first a bishop and then became duke, his duke and bishop simultaneously, he has his coins on one side it says Athanasius um, Episcopus, um, okay, and the other side it, it says Sanctus Januarius, and the other one it has a Yuan, Yuanu, but in, again, mixing Greek and Roman scripts together. Um, and so there's very, very interesting choices being made about how to publicly present yourself. And also just one more point about, about this particular group, the bishops and the dukes, is that we have a history written by a series of deacons, church deacons in Naples in the late 800s and into the early 900s. Um, and they all speak about how the bishops and the dukes could speak both and did speak both Greek and Latin. And they were, they were bilingual. They would flip back and forth depending on who the audience was. And also that they supported both Greek and, Greek and Latin speaking uh, religious communities. And I think that is that it's really interesting to see how that's been playing out uh, since the, maybe the year 600. So we have these migrants coming in 600, some of them coming to Naples, some of them to Rome, some of them to Ravenna. Um, at least in Naples by 900, you have this, this, this sort of culture where the, it's simultaneously Greek and Latin. Um, my, the, around the same time, um, in Rome, there's a very interesting process happening. This is another individual I, I quite like to, to think about, a man named Anastasius Bibliotecarius. Um, so he has a, a, what I would call a, a Greek first name. Um, 
uh, and his title is essentially librarian. He was an abbot. He also worked in for the popes in the papal court. Um, and his job, I mean, he, he was clearly a native Greek speaker who was translating from Greek into Latin. And he translated an enormous number of really important texts. And we know they were, they're important for us now as historians, but they were important for people living in the year 900, in the year 1000, because so many of his translations were copied and spread throughout Europe. Uh, so there was this really, this, this enormous density of Greek materials coming very quickly. Some of them, um, <laughs> some of them I would say quite critical of sometimes emperors. So we have Maximus the Confessor. Um, we have works that are, are real are important spiritual works. So the spiritual men of John Moscus. This is a, this is the work that people want to read but can't in the West. And so it takes a, a, a certain author to translate all of these. Um, the history of Theophanes Confessor, which was a very recent text, is also translated. So this, so what we also know, not only does this person have the capability of translating Greek into Latin, but also in Rome in the year 870, it was easy enough to get texts produced in Constantinople and within a few years have them translated into Latin. And then they spread from Rome into the rest of Western Europe in the Middle Ages. Um, okay, yes. Uh, <laughs> Uh, indeed, Procopius, uh, so I'm, uh, Yannis, I see your comment, and I will just say that, that we could talk much more. Naples is a Greek city. These, the, these are to be read at the end. Yeah, please continue. Yeah, perfect. Perfect. Um, I can, I will, I'll do that at the end. Um, all right. So let me get back to it. So um, the last person I'll, I'll sort of mention on my list of, of people, um, sort of a, sort of a, a kind of a nice coda, um, is a man named George of Antioch. Um, he was known as an Amiras, which is a, from, the, from, from the Arabic word Amir, uh, to Roger II, who was the Norman king of southern Italy. Um, he is, was a very capable uh, administrator. He was an architect. Uh, he was the patron, so he helped construct a church that's known as like La Chiesa della Amiralio, the, the Church of the Admiral, but really known as La Martirana. Um, and he was, he was almost undoubtedly trilingual. So he, he was, Greek was his native language. Uh, he clearly spoke Latin, um, but he also probably spoke Arabic. And he had a career in Antioch, he had a career in North Africa, and he finished his career in Sicily. Um, and it, it's, a, it's through him that we actually kind of get a, a final kind of coda of sort of the capability of these Greeks to move from within different communities, sometimes Byzantine, sometimes in sort of these these various um, Muslim states in North Africa, uh, and then into Norman Italy and, and further north as well. Um, this is uh, actually the image, the dedicatory image of um, from the church of La Matrana, uh, and this is George of Antioch uh, as the doulos and, and the theotopus, which I, as I want to highlight here that he is really interested in the Virgin. For him, the Virgin is the primary um, focal point, not the word, theotopus, right? So depending on if you're coming from an Eastern tradition or Western tradition, it's still sort of quite important. And we'll see it coming back and we'll see why it's important and how it functions with sort of the rest of, uh, the rest of, sort of uh, Italian um, medieval history and, and their involvement of the Greeks. Um, he also, of course, acknowledges his, his boss in, in the church. Um, his boss was Roger, was King Roger II. And obviously this is a panel showing the coronation of the, the divine coronation of Roger. Um, and Roger is a Latin speaker or a Norm, like Norman French speaker. Um, but in this church, the context, he is, again, we have Greek script. He is Rogerius Rex, which is, again, Greek script, but maybe imitating Latin. So a very fascinating, fascinating monument. Um, we know George, he builds a, there's a bridge in Palermo you can visit, but his, his seal, so the seal he would put on his documents, again, uh, contained the contained the Theotokos, right? So the mother of God, and and this is a really interesting thing because 300 years earlier it would have been quite rare to see in in this part of Italy images of the Virgin like this. Um, and so what's actually happening is with all these people coming from the east, they're bringing with them traditions, and one of the traditions is a real intense veneration of um, of, of Mary. Um, and I'll give you some examples of that in a second. I just want to close out this part of the talk by just making a, 
I, I'm a constant wonder of the Normans in southern Italy. Um, I don't particularly like them politically. <laughs> and yes, they don't exist. They haven't existed for hundreds of years. Um, but one of the things that they were able to do is invest in the minority communities under their control. And so there were villages that were Muslim, that remained Muslim, uh, and that they, they had officers in the court who could communicate with them. Lots of Greek villages, lots of Greek monasteries were still being supported by uh, Roger and even the, the, the Norman nobles. And so what we find are a series of monuments um, that Roger, uh, sort of in Roger's court, that have multiple languages. This is the, the probably the, the most fantastic ex exhibit. It's a tombstone and it's quadrilingual. So it's got uh, Greek and Latin. On the top, it's got Judeo-Arabic. Um, and on the bottom, it has a regular Arabic. So really a, a, a kind of an amazing, amazing monument. Um, there's a, also their trilingual inscriptions. Uh, and finally, this is from um, a clepsydra. This, there would have been a, a water clock, some sort of water clock that would have sat on this base. And we have, again, Latin, Greek, and Arabic. So this is very much this, this other kind of Italian history um, that is kind of maybe often overlooked. Which brings me to religious culture. And I, I will hopefully, I, there, there are not six examples. I'm, I'm going down. Each, each time there are fewer examples. I had to cut them so we wouldn't be here all afternoon. Um, and I want to focus on, on three. The first is uh, San, Apolina, San Apolinare of Ravenna, or St. Apollinaris, um, whose, whose traditions are really interesting. And I'll get to that in a moment. Um, the Church of Santa Maria Antiqua in Rome. Uh, and the veneration of Theotokos, or the veneration of Mary. Um, these are three components of what I would call really Greek religious culture or Greek religious traditions that make their way into kind of mainstream medieval Italian culture and are very often not acknowledged. The root is not acknowledged that this comes from, this comes from the East, this comes from Greece. Um, and my favorite example is I, 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 have a, my, I wrote a book about saints. <laughs> this guy was a major part of it. Uh, his name uh, is Apollonatus or Apollonare. Um, um, he is beautifully depicted in this church dedicated um, in the 540s, um, in one of these mainly churches that the Emperor Justinian, who I mentioned at the very beginning of this lecture, helped to build. He did, never went to Italy, but he left money for all these major churches. And this one was dedicated to the person who was the, um, he worked with Peter and he was sort of sort of an apostle of Peter, so an apostle of the apostle, and helped to establish a Christian community um, in the first century in Ravenna. Maybe mythological, maybe not, we're not really sure. But in the 6th century, he was very real. When this church was built, people really believed in St. Apollinaris. And we know this because the cult spreads quite far, at least in Italy. Um, and we also have texts. And this is one of those rare cases where we have a contemporary text. Um, the image is a little weird here. I apologize. Um, and it's in Latin, so don't, but don't worry about it. I'll, I'll, I'll translate the best parts. Um, the text comes from a manuscript from the 6th century that is now in, in St. Petersburg, Russia, but was composed in Ravenna just around the time this, this church was built. And it's the life of Apollinaris. And so Apollinaris is, he doesn't want to go to, to Ravenna. He's following St. Peter, um, but a tribune hears, and the story goes that a tribune hears, there's this healer, there's this guy who's healing people, and the soldiers know about it. And there's a conversation between the soldiers who say, hey, there's this guy, a traveler, um, who helped um, cure a friend of mine's eyesight. And the tribune is like, oh, well, where is he from? I'm translating Latin now. And the soldier responds, ah, he's from the city of Rome. The tribune says, ah, therefore, he, he must be a Roman, of Roman descent. Um, and the soldier says, no, you know what? I don't think he is. Plus tamen grecus esse viditor, which literally means he seems Greek to me. And what this, this is actually really common, um, is that in order to connect the apostolic churches together, you have to have people from the East who bring Christianity to your local town. And Ravenna happens to be a very important local town. Uh, and so this saint becomes important. And he's important because he seems Greek. He is Greek, but, the, 
but that's beside the point. But it's seeming Greek. It really matters in, in 540. And this also might make sense if you if we just go back to those first three individuals I mentioned, right? We've got uh, Theodorus, the Grecus Byzantius, Stephanus, the guy who's giving donations to the church, the Exarch Isaac. Those are all people who identify or identified in some way as Greek, or at least as Eastern. So it makes total sense to have a saint that is modeled on the same way. Um, the other main figure of my book, and this is sort of a tangent, and I promise I won't do too many tangents, uh, has to deal with a saint named Barbatianus. Now, Barbatianus is not a Greek, but the fascinating thing is that the, the myths and the stories and the miracles that he was said to perform come exactly from uh, the miracles of other saints, of Eastern saints, especially of, um, of Abakirus and Yanis. So there's a pair of, of wonder-working uh, healing saints, uh, Cyrus and John, or Cyrus and John. Um, and the Greek versions of their miracles are translated and then purportedly to have been said by this guy, Barbatianus, who is connected to one of the late Roman emperors and his mother, uh, Galvacidia. Not as important. Um, what is important, though, is that so we've got a model in one city where seeming Greek is critical. Seeming Greek is what makes someone holy. Going to Rome, which remember, like Rome is this is this is where they speak Latin. This is the sense. This is the center of kind of the Western Church. And yet, one of the earliest surviving churches is a church known as Santa Maria Antiqua in the Forum. And the, the church has an amazing history. It was built in the fifth century, so very early. It was, uh, it was a, there was a sixth century rededication in frescoes, which I'll show you in a moment. Um, it was redesigned into the eighth century, and then it was buried in an earthquake, or the walls fell at, in the ninth century, and was never was never restored. And so what we have is a window into uh, so things that the, the kind of the frescoes of the eighth century, which were done by uh, popes of Greek origin, which is important in a minute, um, on top of frescoes from the sixth century, um, which are amazing. And so you get this, what's called the palimpsest, where you've got two things written on one page, one having been scraped away. Um, so this is the, the this is why it's Santa Maria in Antigua, and that it has a, uh, an image of um, essentially the, the Hodegitria, right? This is like, this is an image of a of, of bejeweled Mary holding an infant Christ. 100% Byzantine in its origin. And this, this what's known as the jeweled style. So if you ever if you've ever seen the kind of the red monastery in Egypt also has sixth century frescoes that are in the jeweled style. So this would have been the style of the original Hagia Sophia in Constantinople, right? This is a very much in that sixth century just Justinianic age. And here we have it, and on top of it, they've put on other layers. Um, but the church is interesting because it, it's in Rome. It's close enough to some other major churches, uh, and yet it's unclear the exact community it served. Um, we have, of, of course, um, one of my saints, Avakiros. We've got an angel. Um, but what's fascinating is um, on the altar, and this altar stone was probably not original, but was found in the building, uh, you have a clear dedication in which we're using Greek, right? It says, Odulu um, tes theotokos, theotokis, right? So you have this, you've got this wonderful Greek inscription on an altar. And in fact, the altar is, it still exists, it's there. Uh, and it says also on it, um, it's also the, like, it, there's also a parallel in Latin, right, to the, the you know, the servant of, of the Holy Mary. Um, and so you have this monument that again suggests that even in the center of Rome, a papally sponsored building, you've got Greek and Latin working simultaneously. And that uh, uh, it's a building also full of commemorations of saints that are, are Eastern in origin. I think that's, that's also often overlooked um, and I think quite important. Um, which brings me to sort of my last, my last push um, to sort of make sense of what's all this religious culture. Um, and I mentioned before we've got Anastasius Bibliotecarios who's translating all these texts and he's working within the, within the papal administration. But outside of the papal administration in places like Naples, which is very much a Greek city, you have this other, this, these other efforts to translate um, various uh, Greek texts into Latin for popular consumption. Um, and there's one, there's a, a, a relatively anonymous translator named John the Deacon, 
uh, who has two things, which I, I'm, I'm very, I, I think are fascinating. The first is he translates the Vita of Mary of Egypt, which was written about two centuries earlier. So this is, so he's writing around nine, uh, no, not 850. These are being translated. Um, but he's going back to Sophronius, who's writing around 600. Um, the Vita of Mary of, of Egypt. And he's also the conversion of Theophilus, which is another text. But both of those texts play this very key role because they are focused entirely on the efficacy of prayer to Mary. Um, and this really did not exist in Western Europe. Uh, it certainly existed in the East, and it had existed in the East, and there were some churches in the West to the Virgin Mary. Um, but it's not until the life of Mary of Egypt becomes very popular, and it's this version that becomes very popular, um, that the Virgin takes off as a, as a regular um, as a regular saint for devotion. Um, and if you can imagine now, sort of the kind of Western churches, how many of them are dedicated to, to you know, Santa Maria, right? <laughs> In Italy, most of them. Um, but yet that, that did not happen. It could not happen until this, hap until this moment. And so it's at this moment also, this is around 850. After that, you see, you know, things like you can include the, uh, an image of the Virgin on your seal if you're George of Antioch. You can do all sorts of other things that would, would have been unrecognizable earlier. And they are permitted and possible because of the strength of the Greek communities that were still in existence and still very much alive and still reading Greek texts and bringing them from Constantinople or bringing them from Egypt uh, into, um, into southern Italy at this point, um, that, that, you're, that you have this context for things like for things like uh, for things like Mary, and there are actually lots of other examples. The one I cut is um, is you know old Saint Nick, right? Uh, um, so the the fact that you have Nicholas of Mira's relics in Bari, I mean, there's a whole there's a, a, a whole other history. But the history is one of relics and saints and texts moving from the East coming into the West, and certainly by the year 900, it's it's moving um, quite. It's moving very quickly um, to those ends. Um, which brings me to sort of my, my almost, last, uh, almost last points here. Um, and that's the Renaissance legacy. So I've talked a bit about specific individuals who had sort of Greek, who were expressing Greek identities within the context of medieval Italy, their religious traditions that are certainly coming from the Eastern Mediterranean, from Greek-speaking communities coming into Italy. Um, but then there's all this other stuff that exists that is the fuel for, well, let's call it the Italian, Italian Renaissance. Um, and that without those contexts, I can't, I don't know what an Italian Renaissance would have looked like. Um, and I'll, I'll give you two, I'm giving you two kind of wonderful little nucleated um, examples. Uh, the first is um, in the 13th and 14th centuries, there are two major early Renaissance um, painters, uh, Cimabue and Giotto. And Cimabue is, is amazing. He's a painter, but also a mosaicist. So he is building on techniques that are the sort of micro mosaics that come from Constantinople. So Jim, so Jim Aboy has never been to Constantinople. He lives in Florence. He's from Tuscany, but he lives in a world in which, and this is um, also a world in which the Fourth Crusades have already happened. Constantinople was sacked. Many things came from the were taken, not came. Let's be give it some agency, were stolen or seized uh, from Constantinople and brought to Italy. Um, but there is, but that's on top of the fact that there were still Greek communities, that there was still an active market for um, Greek illuminations and Greek icons. Um, and actually, the, and actually just to, I'll, I'll go back for one moment because I, I almost, it's the most important part. That important part of icons um, also then connects to Mary of Egypt. Mary of Egypt is, this is, she is, the, the backstory is that she, she becomes a prostitute very happily at a young age and jokingly joins a ship that goes to Jerusalem uh, and tries to get into a church and cannot, and she's kept out because of the icon of, of uh, probably a hodigitria, uh, one, one icon of, of, of Mary. Um, but so it's the icon of Mary that's really important. And so just moving forward, what do we find? We find icons of Mary that are done in very early Renaissance style, but are still entirely Byzantine. I mean, really, they're stylistically Byzantine, or Italo-Byzantine is what they're called. Um, but they're, it's a very standard, the, the way the faces are depicted, the, the dress, 
um, the backgrounds, or often a blank background, of uh, the forms of the figures. So Chimagoy is working and developing kind of an early Renaissance style, but within the framework of um, of the sort of, of Byzantine traditions. Um, and the most famous one is sort of the Maestra de Santa Trinita. Um, and it's just this, it's, it's an amazing altarpiece. Um, there are two other pieces that go with it. Again, it's very much like a, a, a very much with, a, especially with the hand up, sort of the virgin with her hand raised, very much like a Hodegitria, um, and Old Testament figures below. This could have been, I mean, it's very, very Byzantine. It's moving from models that Chimabue must have seen, so moving from icons that he must have known. Um, his successor, or perhaps his protege, was a man named Giotto, um, and Giotto, Giotto, um, Giotto breaks the mold. He's a little bit younger, um, but basically breaks the, doesn't, I mean, break is the wrong word. He takes the models, which were Italo-Byzantine, and innovates. Uh, and so this is a very famous, this is the Onisanti Madonna. So very, this is, you now have other features going on that are, what well, we consider very much Renaissance, but he's still building from essentially Byzantine models. Um, and even in his, I, I, I'm going to recommend when we can all go, go take trips again. <laughs> if you ever go to uh, Padua, or also known as Padova, um, there's an amazing uh, chapel called the Scrovini, uh, Capello Scrovini, the Scrovini Chapel, um, that was painted by Giotto. And it is just intensely figured. It's an amazing little building, a very early, so 13, I think 13, 15, um, and just absolutely incredible in and it's and it's you can you can see where it's building from things that are Byzantine and what's new and the new part is the is the Italian Renaissance building on top of that. So I've given you my my pitch that um, that both Cimabue and Giotto um, are entirely indebted to um, to Byzantine art and it's true that that, that they are. Um, uh, the last person I'll sort of reference in terms of the sort of this Renaissance legacy um, is a man named Bessarion and you may know Bessarion he's uh, he's famous and or infamous. Uh, he uh, was born in Trabzon um, in sort of in 1403, so at this period where Trabzon is still independent but is entirely surrounded by uh, Ottoman, the Ottoman Empire at that point. Uh, but even then he's educated in, he's educated in philosophy um, in Mistras and Constantinople and Neoplatonism. Um, and he sort of becomes, uh, he's, so he's very well educated, he becomes a um, monk and takes the name of Bessarion and travels with John VIII uh, Paleologus to the Council for our Florence, which is a very famous um, and failed, ultimately failed, I mean, it says it, they said it was successful, it wasn't, um, effort to unify the churches, a sort of an ecumenical movement um, in which uh, there were many, many concessions made by John the Paleologan, and no concessions made by the, the Western churches, but that's, that's, a, that's for another day. Um, Bessarion travels along with this entourage, helps translate things. He, he learns Latin very quickly, learns Italian. We know he learns Italian as well, um, and decides to stay in Italy um, at the conclusion of the council. And he becomes, and he's immediately elevated to a cardinalship. Now he doesn't have, it's not, an, not a politically important one, but he's operating in Northern Italy and he is bringing with him books. Um, so he's very active in sort of like in church affairs and uh, things from the, the Constantinople, late Constantinople coming in. But, but he's also in, crucially important for philosophy because he translates Aristotle's metaphysics uh, into Latin. And it had, it had been known, but not really well, no one really knew it because it was only available in Greek and wasn't really that wasn't really available. So Vestarian plays this, even though he's a church official, he is critically important for what I would call like the development of humanism out of the Italian Renaissance. Uh, it, it happens because Cardinal Vestarian is there. <laughs> Without Cardinal Vestarian, who knows, who knows what, what takes place. Um, and, and just to give you some context for this, so we've, we've, jumped, we've jumped 800 years. Um, in the Italy of the, 1500, uh, the 1400s um, is one where there still are there still are Greeks. They're just they're not as visible. Um, there's certainly Greek communities in the south, southern Italy, um, but that's politically distinct from northern Italy. Um, but there is, for example, after you know after this council, uh, people began offering Greek. They have professors professorships in Greek. The University of Padua, for example. 
Um, but the Council for All Florence is this attempt to bring together all of the disparate churches. So it's the Coptic Church, the Armenian Church, the Greek Church. Um, that's why it takes so long. And it, it, although there is a final resolution, it doesn't it doesn't really work. Um, what's fascinating is is one of the reasons it doesn't work. Um, is I think that the Italians weren't very nice to John VIII and maybe deserved it. Um, this is one of the medals that was um, minted in kind of in honor of his visit to the council. Um, so he's the you know, Autocrator Romaion. So very nicely they're giving him the title of the Emperor of the Romans, um, which is great. But on the negative side, he's also, this is a, a, a contemporary painting by Pedro de la Francesca in which John VIII is, is Pontius Pilate. And so there's this very weird attitude, this kind of very strange shift. And this is, of course, after the Great Schism of 1054. This is after a lot of animosity following the Crusades, especially the, the Fourth Crusade. Um, but there's still, I think, a um, there's a bias against against Greeks, and especially against a Greek emperor like like John VIII. So here he can be depicted as, as Pontius Pilate. Um, <laughs> Maybe that's who knows. Um, the other, the other kind of neat, the neat thing about Basarion, he's a, he's an interesting figure, um, is that he has a he's known to be an authenticator of of important relics, uh, and this is Gentile Bellini. This is a, this is in San Marco in Venice, and this is the procession of the True Cross, um, and the person who is able to identify the True Cross in the relics held in Venice is none other than Basarion, and Basarion in his depiction is always depicted holding this amazing uh, reliquary of the cross that is beautifully ornamented and is all these figural representations done in micro mosaic. Um, and it still exists, you can still go and see it. Um, and Basarian was always depicted sort of connected to it in part to, in part to probably reaffirm his Greekness that he's coming from Constantinople, which originally was the place that had all these relics that were now being distributed um, into uh, Western Europe. So um, I'm going to move on to uh, to my conclusion, and my conclusion is going to is I wish it was really broad. My, like it could be really broad. My conclusion is that um, Greeks are often Greek culture, Greek individuals, Greek identity, Greek language, texts are often o an overlooked as integral parts of medieval Italian history. And so what I've hoped to have shown you is how all of them maybe kind of fit together. And there's, in fact, a much larger story and many more individuals and many more texts that I could probably have brought to bear um, to sort of fill out the rest of this. But I want to kind of focus very narrowly on, on how things must have played out. So um, this is this, such an amazing, uh, an amazing part. I, I love this. So I mentioned at the very beginning that um, the 10th most popular surname in, in Italy right now is Greco. Um, and where does that come from? And I'll tell you exactly where it comes from. We have evidence for it as early as the 900s. Um, and what happened, what had happened is the, the descendants of soldiers who had settled in places like Ravenna or around Naples or around Rome um, began to be call, identified. Um, so you've, you've had these people who've, whose families have, were, have been settled for hundreds of years, 300 years at this point, but begin to be identified as a vocabator greco. So, so who, is, who is also called greco. Or, and you see this so all the time. And that basically becomes essentially a surname. So it becomes a surname as early as 900. And, and so it's, it's, again, I think, very clear um, that there's, that even though there's acculturation and, and people are, are adapting to the Italian peninsula, people who are coming from the east, they're still keeping something that is Greek about them. Um, but there's also this very funny cross-fertilization because there are, we, we have a number of examples of local, local Italians who adopt this, who, I wouldn't call them philhellenes, that's not exactly what they're doing, but who are really interested in the Greek language, the access it could give them to text, but also sort of identifying themselves in a way that even though they are clearly Italian, but they're sort of playing with the notions of being Greek as well, or, or are interested in what being Greek might show them. And so my final example is just this, it's the most amazing thing. So, um, so this is a guy named Liu Prand of Cremona. He's a bishop. Uh, he's working in the 950s for the German emperor, the German Ottonian emperors. 
Um, and he's actually sent as an ambassador to Constantinople, and he very he's he's mistreated. Um, the, the reason he's mistreated is he tries to steal purple, <laughs> tries to steal, <laughs> to steal uh, purple cloth out of the imperial palace in Constantinople. Anyway, that's a much longer story. Um, but we actually have his manuscripts, the ones he wrote himself. Uh, they're in Munich right now, um, and they're absolutely fantastic because he is not afraid when the, from time to time to just in, interject things in Greek. He knows Greek well enough, um, and he wrote a, a homily on Easter, which we've now just passed, and I, so if I, the timing was different, this would have been even, even, even better. Um, but he, this is a, at the top of his homily, which he wrote in Latin, he wrote this little, this little thing, Omelea to Liuziu to Italian, Italicu Diaconu. So, the homily of Liuzius, the Italian deacon, but he's writing in Greek. And I, I think this is just, this is just, I think, another, another feature of this. He's not writing in Greek because it's, I mean, who is he showing off to? He's part of this world in which Greek is just kind of, a, I think, a natural component of uh, medieval uh, Italian history. So, um, that's what I've got, and I really appreciate all of your patience and for sitting with me this afternoon. I'd be very happy to have a conversation and answer questions. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor. So I will now read the questions as they were given, and everyone, uh, feel free to add the questions to the chat so I can read them. So. Athena Christine Palo, Palombi notes, as, as well as many remnants of Greek in the Neapolitan dialect and words that still exist in, uh, in, the, in the Italian language that the Greek as well as five letters in the Italian alphabet, I would also note uh, the Drangheta, of course, which comes from the Greek name Andragantima. Absolutely. I won't even get to the food. Uh, the, the, all these are all these wonderful local food words, which are a hundred, which are just Greek words that Italians, that Italians don't realize they've they've just adopted them. Well, Mom didn't make a comment. I remember from reading the history of the Greek nation, Volume Six, about the uh, Greeks and Romans dealing with the imperial era. That it mentions that Prokofius during the siege of Naples by Belisarius. She says that Naples was inhabited by Greeks who wanted Belisarius to enter rather than their Goth overlords. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a, that's, um, that's a really wonderful story. Um, and what's interesting is that, and I, I, I actually have a chapter of this in my own book, um, it, it's just indicative of the fact that even, even when Italy was no longer under like, like Western imperial control, um, it still had these amazingly strong connections um, to other Greek-speaking communities. So clearly Sicily and Naples, there was a, a thing going back and forth for centuries. And I think it did suppose these... Back and forth, yeah. Still yeah. back and forth, yeah. Still. <laughs> so, uh, Fina, uh, Christine uh, Palomandri also mentions that the church, there is Greek and Latin inside St. Peter's Basilic, I assume. The new St. Peter's Basilica. Yeah. So, I afterwards comment that century the Egyptians commemorated the fifth week of Lent, which would be three weeks ago, and uh, you're su our priest is supposed to actually read her entire life of St. Mary the Egyptian, though usually after the kids have left for Sunday school. how <laughs> <laughs> she was doing well, what she was doing in Egypt, and then she went on that trip to um, to Jerusalem, and then she had at the Church of the Holy uh, of the Holy Sepulchre her incident. She left for the desert on the other side of the Jordan. I also mentioned afterwards that I know Giotto mostly from the ASA space from the Caliph's comic, with because apparently in his uh, veneration of uh, the three magi, uh, the star of uh, the three magi is. Uh, um, is actually is believed to be Hale's comet, which had passed off at that time. There, I, if, if you get, if you will bear with me, you know what's amazing? So uh, uh, I, I'm gonna just go ahead and go back to my um, the 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 tomb of the exarch Isaac has on it the Virgin, the Child, and the three Magi, 
Um, and it's actually one of the first representations. It's that and the church, the church of San Apollinare uh, Nuova, and also in Ravenna. So those are the those are the earliest representations in in the sixth century. So it's yeah. Um, yeah, you, you have stopped sharing your screen right now, by the way. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I I can continue. Well, now I can see people. So this is <laughs> this is. I'll, I'll share again if we need to. All right. Well, I afterwards I mentioned that the Vesario is very well known in Greece, has been also the creator of the Martian Library, and then Vasilis Buzuris also mentions that uh, Georgios Gemistos Plithon and a few others are also known from that particular era, the twilight of the Byzantine Empire. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it's, can I, I mean, I'll ask this, this the question about Bessarion because I, I've never asked. I, I mean, he, <laughs> how is he? How is he understood? Because in many ways, I mean, he sort of a, he abandons the empire. He abandons the Byzantine Empire. Um, so I don't. I always feel I'm ambivalent towards him. Um, there is quite a guy. There's someone who actually did go a ninth grade in Greece, which is where we mostly learn about Vesarion. And honestly, our, our impression towards Vesarion is quite ambivalent. I remember something like on. And it was, it was either May 29th or uh, last year, I think, uh, because it hasn't come here yet, where one of those military Greek websites actually did have an article on Vesarion that was rather more positive. And the feeling is that if he had actually succeeded to become both, our opinion of him would have been far more positive than what it is right now. But we appreciate that he brought Greek letters to the West. I don't know if someone else wants to contribute. If I mute yourself so you may talk, yeah. Okay. I'm not seeing anybody unmuting themselves, so I'll continue. Uh, well, uh, this comes to what you mentioned in the end, all the people named Greco coming from Greek soldiers. Well, I don't know if you've heard of the Stradioti of the Renaissance, that in several respects were a light cavalry, that in several respects were the Greek army in exile, under the service of Venice, and they did settle in Italy, and many of their descendants actually did fight for the Greek Revolution following the dream of their ancestors in 1821. So, I'll continue from Vasilis Zarenti. When did the son in Gregor get established in Italy? The first Gregor was established in the Ottoman Empire. So um, that's, a, that's an excellent question. Um, I mean, it's the the uh, the surnames are, are actually quite. I mean, they're 11th and 12th century, but even before then, you began to see. I mean, my example here from the from the 900s, you have people who are called uh, Wokabator Greco or mostly Deto Greco, which is a, not exactly a surname, but it, but it's it, it's inherited. So it's like, you know, so it's like Paolo Deto Greco. So Paul, who's known, otherwise known as the Greek Paul, right? And so I, I think it's, so that is, that starts early and, and continues. You don't seem to find it in kind of the, the most, most elites. Elites have fancier names, mostly of places. Um, but in sort of what we would consider to be like a, a middle class, a middle class landowners, lots of people called Deto Greco or Greco. Um, and I think it then depends on on when that when last names are really become crystallized. It takes it, it different times in different regions of Italy, um, which is why you actually see I, I I suspect so many people with the name Greco in Puglia and Calabria. And um, and actually speaking of the Greek Revolution, I, definitely there were Greeks from from Puglia who came and 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 migrated and served and, and fought against the Ottomans. So it's a it's an interesting. I mean, I, I don't know. If, I don't want to call them. I don't know if they're Italians. I don't know if they're they're Greeks. I mean, they're they're both simultaneously. But they sort of they live in both worlds as well. And I, I it's a just a fascinating uh, kind of a fascinating model of of diasporas. I think. So, uh, Evangelic Malat, thank you very much for your presentation. It was a great travel, a great way to travel through history. Uh, Mr. Kopoulos, is uh, commanding your enthusiasm for Byzantine culture is very captivating and fun to read. To learn, sorry, I'm reading. 
Um, now, Afinatri Sin uh, Palo, Palobis is mentioning that also in Venice during that time and after the fall of Constantinople that there is a Saint George, uh, there is a Greek Orthodox Church there in Venice, so I would add to Saint George of the Great and it was founded after action of the Stradioti. Vasilis mm -hmm. uh, uh, Mildurich uh, said that uh, the siren is understood as a traitor. So, yeah, I, I would say that it's considered. Uh, yeah. There are several points of view about the siren, yeah, more like I'm building with what I got from my high school. But yeah, I'm not the only one who went to high school in Greek, necessarily. Yeah. yeah. So, Athena Christine uh, is also a defense against San Giorgio de Greco, which was the center of the Spola, uh, San Nicolo de Greco, also in Sardinia. There are many Greek surnames, the Greek community there in Venice. Yeah, I remember that the something like the 17th century, 10% uh, of the population of Venice was Greek. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. Well, that, that, that absolutely makes sense. Um, I mean, Venice has both had the, the ability to support. I mean, Venice is, I mean, between the fact that it, it controlled, like, it controlled major territory. I mean, it, controlled, I mean, it was an empire full of Greeks. Um, but also, I think that the city itself, especially once you, especially when you're in the 15th century and the 16th century, with the ability to print um, and as a center for publication and, and learning, not necessarily as a university town, but as a, but as a place that had those aspects, was very attractive. I mean, it's also there are communities of Armenians, for example, that end up the Mekaharis, right? So there, there are, I think, lots of this sort of pull um, that Venice is able to produce. Although the the, Sar the Sardinian example is fascinating. So um, I didn't tell you this, but this is like I I love this. There's a that we have a wonderful Greek inscription um, from Sardinia from around the from around 600, maybe 650. Um, that I I I'll, write about my book, but I didn't include in this presentation because I didn't have all the time, of, of someone who's a, who's a, who's a, a, um, I mean, a general, a strategos, a, a, you know, strategos but, a, but, but probably, a, probably a naval, a naval official who had been fighting off pirates. Um, and, you know, he, just like the Exarch Isaac, he established this, um, but rather than to commemorate his death, he was commemorating victories, some, a, a number of, of naval victories. And, and it's amazing. I, I think that if you if you you want to put up a monument, you want people to read it, and so you put it in a language that people can read. And we have, for example, the Exarch Isaac. We know he has some monuments in Latin, and we have there's a few in Greek. It's depending on the audience. And this one in Sardinia was um, this amazing. This it, it, it's amazing because it would have been for a community to read it, and the community would have been would have been Greek speakers. And so it's it's such a wonderful connection that I think I think survives. And I don't know enough about the history of Sardinia after the ninth century, but um, yeah. So um, well, the book that I'm writing right now, <laughs> uh, I haven't finished it yet. It's um, I, I want to. It's going to be called. You know, bear with me. The title still in flux. Eastern undercurrents, uh, Greeks and Greek identity in medieval Italy. Um, and it's, I'm in negotiation with the University of Pennsylvania Press. Uh, it's mostly written, but COVID makes things go, go slower. Um, my other book is called, um, what is it called? I have to go get off the cell. Ah, my other book is called uh, Rediscovering Sainthood in Italy, Hagiography hey, and the Late Antique Past in Medieval Ravenna. Um, this is where I get sort of my material on on some of the saints, and uh, especially the like San Polinare, uh, Barbatianus, um, some of the other stuff about the Virgin uh, I've written about here. Um, yes, wait, and then and actually the wonderful thing about publishing with the University of Pennsylvania is that their books are not are are not too expensive. They're like normal priced books, as opposed to this poor book, which my parents are the only people who bought copies. It's like a hundred dollars. Don't buy this book. You can download it from a library. It's, I mean, you could. You could read it, but yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, well, um, what was the primary reason that Italian nowadays, or the, on the south, in fact, still maintain some dialect mixed with Greek words? What kept it alive? Religion, ethnic culture, what else? I think he's referring to the Greco. Yeah. The, the Grecanos. Yeah. That. So that. So the. So the. Yeah. I mean, it's. 
I think they're they're probably two or inter, two or three interconnected things. I think certainly the the communities that actually speak Greek, the, the communities in Calabria and Puglia, uh, for that for them it was just it's you know those are, these are essentially agricultural communities that are live in very mountainous regions, and no one ever made them change their language. And what's also actually interesting is that nearby there are all there are communities with more recent immigrants from um, more recent I mean from the 18th century of Albanians who still speak Albanian um, and so you have kind of each valley people are speaking their own language and so there's less pull um, from other cultures and following so it, it, Italy wasn't unified until the 19th century actually it's the Greek state's older than the Italian state <laughs> um, uh, as, as, a, as modern states go and, and so I think there was never really um, there was never really a common need for communities in the South to to regularize their vocabulary, get rid of the Greek words, and also there there, there were Greek newspapers in Southern Italy up until in the 1920s and 1930s until fa until fascism made it um, made it more difficult. Um, ah yes. So, uh, so that's the that's the first question. This, the, this, the, the other Vasilis has this wonderful thing about Greek identity. Yeah, um, I already I have to comment the following: What exactly constitutes Greek identity? Something that it enforced entire libraries. Yeah. So, um, could you comment exactly what was the Greek identity? The thing that the people identify the such as used by others are uh, that they view themselves as Greek speaking more from the legitimate Roman citizens. This included. Ethnic Armenians, the Jetablas, ethnic Italians, Slavs, uh, Cappadocians, etc. Um, as I said, this is something that can, you can fill entire libraries. If you would like to comment, please don't take another hour or so. Yeah. I, I won't. I, I have no, I mean, the a Greek identity is really interesting. I mean, there are, there are people who play in the NBA who, I can, who are Greek, and they're amazing. Um, the, the extent to how Greek they are is is it's it's complicated i think in in many i think what i what i've looked to do is to look for um people who internally represent that either in language or in or religious choices or in even calling themselves at least in the in latin you know grecus no one i mean they would never call themselves grecus that's not but for everyone else is a yeah sure we'll, we'll call ourselves greek um so i'm interested in that sort of the self the self greek identity it is it is really hard um, because there are, as you mentioned, sort of like ethnic Albanians, um, certainly like uh, ethnic Armenians who pro who are speaking Greek in the Middle Ages. Uh, and to what extent does that uh, did they differentiate themselves? I mean, also the fact that you know even in medieval Greece has multiple versions of Greek. I mean, the Greeks who live in, in Constantinople are very different who, for example, the Greeks that live like in the Peloponnese, right? They're just, it, 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 there's just, uh, <laughs> there are, there are, are real cultural differences, uh, I think, that continue to play out in the, in the Middle Ages. Um, but it's, it's so, I, I'm not going to write, I'm writing a book about it, but that's focused on this, <laughs> and, and I don't have a conclusion yet. So I'm going to leave that for a moment. Yeah, I have to mention that I'm from Asian migrant descent. My grandfather, well, he came, he, he did go to first grade in Trivia of Bithynia, and he came here a refugee. And I think that this part of the family was called Turkospori, etc. Well, people stopped doubting his Greekness when he fought against the Italians in World War II. You know, the greatest proof of Greekness was his manly hair, was the standard issue yeah. manly hair, yeah, <laughs> of the Greek <laughs> army. Yeah. So yeah, so Athena Christine uh, uh, Palombi, who has just left, as I see, she says that uh, from Sardinia, I think from Sardinia, uh, that it's uh, in a Molise part of her family is from that region. There are very still strong remnants of the Albanian communities. Um, Vasilis Vuzuric mentions that he thinks that the key is legitimate Roman, that they call themselves Romans, Romios. I mean, yeah. those who don't identify as Greeks. Yeah. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's a, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, um, there, so the, 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 the Roma, the, yes, the, the fact that you call yourself from, like, like, the yeah, a community of Romayoi, um, yeah. is, uh, it's, it, it, it can mean two, I mean, it, you're right, it has these, but it has these interesting connotations because at times 
it can be really political. Um, and if you have an emperor who's not very good, it may be impolitical to say, you know, I'm I'm a you know, where my always like doesn't make it, it. It may be a disadvantage to do that. Um, but again, it is it is it's interesting, and it's also interesting if you are in Rome, the city of Rome, <laughs> but you but you understand yourself to be you know, uh, a member of this community of Romeo, it, it's, what that looks like is, is complicated. I mean, and, and, you know, there's a Cal Dellis, uh, who's at Ohio State, has written about four books now on variations of Byzantine identity um, and, and Hellenism. So, so there's a lot of ink to be spilled. A couple of months ago, a couple of years ago, I remember the ecumenical patriarch uh, recommending or something he, he described to the Greeks as to Efsevet Genos ton Romeon, the pious nations of the Romans. Mm -hmm. So let me continue. Uh, yeah, from Alexander, I think it's Alexander Malatang, I guess. Uh, continuing from Greek massage to the United States, I found that the Byzantine history is not explored extensively. It's just asking what is your opinion? And I would like to add, you know, uh, ancient Greek history is not taught very extensively in this country either. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's it's. Um, I think there's a. Uh, I have many colleagues. I I've been trained as a Byzantinist. Um, I went to UCLA, which has a very long history of uh, of of supporting Byzantine studies. Um, and in order to in order to have that work, you need to have both people who can teach the language and people who can do the history and culture. Um, and those are those tend to be investments universities don't want to make anymore. Um, the, there isn't a clear solution, although what I try to do is, you know, the Byzant so Byzantine history is fascinating and it, it works well if you don't exclude it from the rest of Europe. And this I think is, so in the, you know, the 50 years ago would have been its own, you know, its own, its, its own discipline. But yet I, I see it's no, it's really no different than the history of medieval France and we should treat them the same way. And so I, I offer its course on Byzantine history because that's what I'm trained in. And when I teach regular, you know, Western European history, we, I mean, we don't ever give up the Byzantine Empire. It is there, it's there 100% of the time. And in fact, the course ends with uh, in 1253 um, because that's for me the end of the end of the Middle Ages, the end of what's interesting. Um, and so I think there's a, what, in order for it to survive, it has to reintegrate itself into, especially in, in the United States, into sort of general medieval studies. It's a, it's the way in which we would have like the, you know, medieval Spain or medieval Germany. You could all, we also need to think, think about medieval Greece in that same way. Yeah, I think you're uh, you're muted. Sorry. Uh, oh, sorry. I mute myself because there is, um, I live on an intersection and noise is coming. Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, so, uh, what Felix will do is uh, continue where they call themselves from me. Uh, he says that um, this, this may explain why there is a suppression of the cultural heritage and that legitimacy as uh, Romans of the Romeos was uh, denied. So, um, are there any other questions? Yes, I would like to ask a question about the influence of ancient Greek philosophy and the manuscripts who were produced at that time, I would say start with the 200 uh, AD, for instance, or around that time, and up to 900, because I noticed that you mentioned the translation uh, on 1400. What about the previous times? And uh, relevant to this question is, were there uh, any education in Italy uh, about the Greek philosophers and about Greek knowledge at that time, like second century, third century uh, AD? Uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful question um, because what it, it, it points to is a lacuna, a gap. Um, it's clear, I mean, in, in, for example, in Pompeii and Herculaneum, and Herculaneum that there are there's lots of circulating Greek philosophy in scrolls in the second century, in the first century AD, the second century AD. Um, in the West, after the arrival of Christianity, n no one reads it. 
Um, and so uh, what, what continues to circulate and continues to be valuable in Eastern and sort of Eastern culture, which never really, so you never really give up philosophy in Constantinople. You have Christianity and philosophy and two branches moving forward. But that doesn't exist in Italy. Italy just abandons, for the most part, abandons, at least in the Latin, the Latin speaking side, abandons philosophy. Um, and only and has to rediscover it later. Uh, it takes it takes a long time. Um, to, that there's a, an enormous process, um, and it's very slow. And in, in part, what the other thing that happens is that outside of really outside of southern Italy, there are very few very few individuals who have the ability to actually translate Greek or read Greek, and so you have to have it in Latin. And if there are no translations. People don't have it, so it, it really it, it takes it takes a long time. I mean, by 900, certainly yes, there's a new kind of new impetus to discover sort of to discover philosophy, um, especially as you begin to see universe like early universities form. Um, but there's a there's a gap of 700 years where no one where no one know, I mean. You know, no one knows who Aristotle is, which is which I find to be, which I find to be quite crazy. Um, but but you know, it's you know, no one no one reads Plato, no one's reading no one's reading Aristotle, and um, and and they don't know what they're missing, and that's the other that's the, the other key part. And it's only with these reconnections to Constantinople do people begin to realize, oh wow, there's there are actually people who already thought about this two thousand years ago and figured it out. Maybe I should be reading it too. Uh, yes, I muted. Sorry. Um, so the last one I'm seeing is from a person who, for his email, is called Gigi Evangelatos. He said that he's a UCLA graduate, class of '71, and by 23 and me, he found out he's 40% Sicilian. And being from Cefalonia, there is a strong Venetian influence. It was on seven centuries under uh, Venice. Una fata una rata. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so that that works. <laughs> um, I, I think yeah, all I of the uh, from genetic testing that apparently uh, that Sicilians have a very strong genetic affinity to Peloponnesians, which has to do with the fact that it was colonized by Dorian. Yep. I I the best door the best door temples are in are in, are, are in Piacum and Agrigentum. Um, yeah, I, there's that. I would also suggest that, I mean, so I've done, I don't really do much genetics, but I have colleagues who do. It, those are always like the grain of salt um, because it's, it's hard to figure out when, when exactly those connections stop. Um, and in fact, part of, the re, part of the interesting thing is that they're always this back and forth. Like the, the Ionian Islands are, I mean, the, the <laughs> There are Italians there all the time, and there are Greeks there all the time, and there's back and forth. And the same is true in in southern Italy. And I didn't mention I didn't mention this, but southern Italy, I've now counted at least seven waves of migration to southern Italy to Puglia and Calabria uh, since the year 600. And so it, it's like which which wave could it be? Could it be like could it be the population that have always been there? Are they escaping Sicily? Are they coming from? Uh, the fall of you know the fall of of, of Byzantine uh, Antakya of, of Antioch. So it, so they're all they're all these I think different times that genetic evidence doesn't help explain. I mean it help explain the connections, but it doesn't exactly explain when the connections were when the connections are are, are formed. Although it it's fascinating what we learn also from that. I have to go. You guys were it's just marvelous, marvelous presentation. Thank you so much. Excellent. I have mentioned that we need a separate lecture on this. So, are there any other questions? With that, I would like to thank all the contributors for their questions. I would like to thank uh, Professor for his lecture today. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you.